Hey future respiratory therapists, today we're starting a new four part series and this four part series is going to be all about pulmonary function testing. I know many of you are getting ready for your board exams, some of you, of you are preparing for final exams that may have this information on it and I understand that pulmonary function testing is a challenge. It's always a challenge area. That and hemodynamics complaints all the time. So. Um, received lots of requests for this so we're going to get it out there now okay so here's the deal part one is going to be over FVC and FEV1 and how we use those numbers to identify restrictive versus obstructive lung diseases now part two is going to go into lung volumes part three is going to go into diffusion capa diffusing capacity and in part four we'll bring all of them back together and we will do an all big kind of a collaborative look at how these look because right now it looks simple there's just a little bit of information on the board right now the other thing you want to know is is that this is probably several weeks worth of lecture okay so all i'm giving you is the key nuts and bolts of figuring out if the patient is restrictive or obstructive we're not going in to the middle airways we're not going into uh, maximum voluntary ventilation. We're not going into all that because um, I don't have three weeks to do all that. So we're going to try to do this in a short amount of time as possible and give you what you need to know. Okay, so today's objectives are strictly over the FEC and the FEV1. Let's jump into it. Now what you see on the board here is three different patients, same age, same height, same sex. That's why they all have the same predicted values. Now it's like that because I simply just wanted to, to make it easier so I didn't have as much numbers on the board. We can do this like this. So three different patients, patient one, patient two, and patient three. We're going to identify which one is normal, which one is restrictive, and which one is obstructive. Okay, so here we go. The first thing you have to do is you have to understand what the FEC is and what the FEV1 is. Okay, so when I say FVC, I'm talking about forced vital capacity. Now we know that a vital capacity is the three volumes that make up vital capacity is tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume. That's what a vital capacity is. Now when you put the word, the word forced in front of it, it becomes a forceful vital capacity. In as deep as you can, all the way to IC, and then blast it out as hard as you can, and keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, right? You want these patients to blow out for longer than six to seven seconds. If you can get them to 10 seconds, fantastic. Some of your obstructive disease patients may be able to get out a good force vital capacity, but it may take them 12 to 15 seconds to get it out, okay? But the key here is you're, you're exhaling out as hard as you can, all the way out to RV. And then the pulmonary function uh, device or machine will do the calculations in figuring out how much of a volume that was. Okay, now again, these are all based off of predicted values. So what we're looking at here are percentages of predicted values. The number itself doesn't really help you. What helps you is the percentage of predicted value. So let's break down the FVC for each of these three patients in a percentage standpoint. So if I put another one here, and I'm going to end up erasing this, that's FEC percentage. If I do, and this is what you should do when you get these numbers, when you get this type of table, you have to break these down into percentages if they're not given for you. 3.9 divided by 4.4. That's because the patient blew out 3.9 liters. The predicted was 4.4 liters. So 3.9 divided by 4.4 is approximately 80 seven percent this goes with patient one now patient two blew out 1.75 divided by 4.4 now you already see where this is going right they clearly didn't blow out even close to what they were predicted right so what's going on here we'll see what happened what happens here very very soon this is approximately 40 percent and then the last one forcefully exhaled 2.9 liters out of a predicted 4.4 and this gives us 66%. Now, the key here is that the, 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 the amount that you want to be to describe normal or not normal is greater than 80%. So of the patients we have on this screen right now, we have one patient who would be normal and that would be patient number one. Now, the fact that these two are abnormal does not tell us if it's obstructive or restrictive. It just tells us that they're abnormal. 
Okay, so bear with me because I'm going to show you how we differentiate between normal and that or obstructive and restrictive because right now we don't know. Okay, so let's look at the FEV1. Okay, now when we look at the FEV1, we're going to call it the FEV1, and this is percent of normal. This is not the FEV1 percent, so please do not confuse what I'm saying right now. This is the FEV1 percent of normal. All right, so when we look at the first one, we can see that the first one, um, in the first second, which is what FEV1 stands for, forced expiratory volume one, in the first second. Makes sense, right? Forced expiratory volume in the first second. Now this measurement is derived from the FVC. So you get this number, all in the same maneuver. You pay for a patient taking a big deep breath out, deep breath in, all the way in, inspiratory capacity, blast it out as hard and as fast as you can, blow all the way out to RV, and within that you will be given this value of 3.68. Now when we look at 3.68 for this patient, we see that normal was 3.65, so they actually blew out 101% uh, yeah, 101% of their predicted. Okay, we'll talk about this in just a second. Now the second one blew out 1.6. Their predicted was 3.65. They blew out 44% of their predicted FEV1%. Okay, now the third one exhaled 1.56 in the first second, and they were predicted to, to exhale 3.65, and that turns into 40 three percent of their predicted FEV1 okay now again we know this is normal okay because anything greater than 80 percent over here we consider that to be a normal FEV1 okay now if it's greater than 80 percent it's normal so we clearly have identified that this patient over here had a normal FEC and a normal FEV1 percent so this is probably our normal patient, right? And we'll keep doing it, but we kind of have already figured out that this is our patient that is normal. Two and three, we still don't know which one is obstructive and which one is restrictive. They both have abnormal FVCs and FEV1s because both of them are less than 80%. Okay, so you can't deduct from this if it's restrictive or obstructive. Okay, now, here's the key factor, okay? You have to do what we call the FEV1%. Not the percentage of normal, but the FEV1%. Okay, now to do this, you, you simply take your FEV1 and you divide it by your FVC. And that will give you your FEV1%. You may even actually see it illustrated like this. And what they're saying is we're going to divide the FEV1 by the FEC and that's going to give us our FEV1 percentage. Now what this tells you is, is what percent of the total volume exhaled came out in the first second? What percent? So this will not be a number, this will be a percentage, okay? So let's check it out. Patient number one, exhaled 368, 3.68 divided by 3.9. They exhaled 90 4%. That means 94% of the volume, the total volume that they exhaled, they exhaled 3.9, 3.68 of it came out in the first second. If this sounds like a patient who doesn't have a problem getting volume in or getting the volume back out, right? All their volumes are normal. We'll talk about the FEV1% normal here in just a second. Now, when we look at patient number two, we see that they had terrible numbers, right? 1.6 divided by 1.75, and this equals 91%. Well, wait a second. These numbers are terrible, but this number seems to be pretty good. I mean, 91 seems like a good number. We'll see here in just a little bit, okay? And then when we look at patient number three, we get 1.56 divided by 2.9, and we see that they exhaled 54% of their total FVC, only 54% of it came out in the first second. Now, if you want to know what normal is, it's greater 
than 70%. Okay, so 70% is your marker here. So let me show you what we're looking at here. Okay, I'm gonna erase this. When we, we already know that patient number one is our normal patient. So let's talk about two and three. Less than 80%, less than 80%. It could be restrictive lung disease or it could be obstructive lung disease. Either one. Less than 80, less than 80 could be restrictive or obstructive. Okay, now here's the key. You have to understand what restrictive lung diseases are and you have to understand what what obstructive lung diseases are. Obstructive lung diseases cannot get air out. They are obstructed to expiratory flows. So the air does not come out in a normal uh, time frame is what it does for either normal airflow or either restrictive airflow. Now restrictive lung diseases, they have a problem getting volumes in, but they have no obstruction to getting that volume out. So think about this. If you have a patient who can only get a little bit of volume in, and when they exhale, most of that comes out in the first second, such as this patient, 70% is your cutoff. This patient, FEV 1% is 91%. That means that, yeah, they could only get in 40 and 44% of their volumes, okay? They could only get in, they could only exhale 40% of their predicted force vital capacity, they could only excel 44% of their predicted FEV1. Yet when you put these two values in ratio with each other, 91% of this 1.75 came out in the first one second. That does not sound like an obstructive lung disease patient, right? So when you look at this, you go decreased, decreased, normal, this person, must be a restrictive lung disease patient. Why? Because this FEV1% is greater than 70%, which means this person does not have an obstructive disorder. Now, when you look at the patient in number th column three, they were decreased, they were decreased, and their FEV1% as well decreased. So you see here where we're the same right here. But the FEV1% is the differentiating factor between restrictive and obstructive lung diseases. Okay? So this person has an obstructive lung disease because their FEV1% is less than 70%. Okay? They can only get out half the air that they're attempting to get out in, in the first second of their FVC. Okay? So... That's the first thing I want to show you. The FEV1% is your differentiating factor in diagnosing restrictive versus obstructive lung disease when your FVC and your FEV1s are also decreased. Now, if everything is normal, then everything is normal, okay? So, we know now, I'm going to erase all this, okay? We know now that this is our normal patient. This is our restrictive lung disease. This is our obstructive lung disease. Now, when I say restrictive lung disease, I'm talking about things like pulmonary fibrosis. Um, I mean, it, anything other than a C-babe, really. Uh, but pulmonary fibrosis, any of your, if you're, any of your interstitial um, uh, pulmonary diseases, your ARDS, your pneumonias, pleurodiffusion, pneumothorax. Now, obviously, you're not going to do a pulmonary function on a pneumothorax. But my point here is, is restrictive lung diseases are everything that's not a C-babe. Okay, now when you're talking about obstructive lung diseases, this is where you're talking about your C-babe. So over here, this patient might be emphysema, chronic bronchitis, together makes COPD, asthma, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis. That's your obstructive lung disease disorders. Now, could they have an airway tumor that's also causing an obstruction? Possibly. Okay, so don't restrict it just to C-babes, but thinking outside of your C-babes, you're talking about some sort of airway obstruction, uh, most likely related to um, a tumor or something like that. Okay, so now we know we have restrictive lung disease here and obstructive lung disease here. Now, let me break this down one step further for you, because you may not be given these numbers. You may just be given graphs, flow volume loops, and you have to say which one is obstructive or restrictive. Okay, well, let's show you. I'm going to go normal, restrictive, and obstructive. So your flow volume loop looks something like this. 
That is what normal would look like. Now restrictive would look more like this. So remember, this is the normal predicted, but look, they can only get in a little bit of volume, but then it all comes out very quickly. Okay, now what you want to think about when you think of restrictive lung disease is think of very small, like a witch's hat. Okay, if you know any witches, <laughs> I don't, but if you do, then this is at least the image that we think of when we think of witches' hats, right? So think of a witch's hat for the illustration of a restrictive lung disease flow volume loop. Now, when we think about obstructive flow volume loop, we're going to find something that looks more like this. You see, it's supposed to normally just come straight down because there's no obstruction in the airways. But this person has an obstructive lung disease, and so we don't see this come down normally. Instead, we see what we identify as a scoop. I tell my students to remember, anytime you see a scoop in the loop, it equates an obstructive lung disease. Okay, so don't forget that because these types of things might show up on your exams. You might see them doing a bedside spirometry. You might see them on your MBRC exams. You might see them. Understand that the illustration of this alone can help you identify obstructive versus restrictive versus normal lung diseases. Now the last thing that you need to keep in mind when we talk about this, just for completion's sake, is that there is also a way that these can present on a volume time graph. Okay, now normal will look like this. The patient will start to exhale and you will see this rise very, very quickly. So this point right here would be your one second mark. Okay, so you can see here their FEV1 greater than 70% of their total volume. This is their total volume here. They blew out 94% of it in the first one second. Okay, now your restrictive lung disease will look just like this, except it'll be smaller because they didn't take in as much volume. Remember, volume is over here, so the more volume goes up. This patient will look like this. Now again, this is total force vital capacity. Their FEV1 is right there, or here's one second right here. So their FEV1 is right here. They blew out more, 91% of their total force vital capacity in that first second, okay? And so you gotta realize that these two look just alike except the restrictive is much smaller. Now when we talk about the obstructive, you're gonna see where it looks something more like this. Now look what happened. It's much more at an incline. It doesn't just come straight up and then curve off. Their flows are obstructed, so the air comes out much slower, and they eventually get it out with more time, but that initial one second is much smaller than what their total FEC is, and this is where you see we're at 54%, okay? So those are the things you need to remember when it comes to pulmonary function testing, at least from FVC, FEV1, FEV1%, percent is the differentiating factor. Remember your scoop in a loop on your flow volume loop is indication of an obstructive lung disease. A witch's hat, a much smaller, tighter, narrower witch's hat is indicative of a restrictive lung disease. And then your volume time waveform, a slow rise equals obstructive. A normal steep rise with a plateau is your normal, and then a smaller normal rise with a plateau will be your restrictive lung diseases. I hope this, I hope this helps, guys. I really do. I hope you're looking at this going, yes, this FEV1% is what I was missing. I never understood what it was. Remember, it's 70% is your cutoff. Your FEC and your FEV1 are 80% normal, but your FEV1% is 70% is your cutoff. If it's less than 70%, it's an obstructive lung disease. Greater than 70%, it's either normal or a restrictive lung disease. Hope this helps. Leave me some comments. Hit the like button. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe. Okay, I'm getting lots of views right now from non-subscribers and I don't know why. If you don't like my content, then unsubscribe. But trust me, the only thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna put a video every couple of days into your inbox, aiding you in becoming a better respiratory therapist and making school easier for you. So give me the opportunity, hit the subscribe button. Best wishes.